you live on 133 bucks a month for food? I should try it because you know how fabulous I'd look. I'd be so skinny. I mean, if you have my hands, I have 10 pounds. It really does. I would be looking great. We really messed up. And we're all very sorry. I personally apologize to you that that happened. I am the worst journalist in the world. The White House soup of the day. My favorite radio guy in Fort Lauderdale. It's minestrone chicken sausage. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Welcome to Breaking a Set. I'm your host, Abby Martin. You know, it seems that on every issue important to Americans, the problem, reaction, and solution is always framed by the two dominating political parties in this country. The problem is that these two teams, Democrats and Republicans, more closely resemble a single party, one that stands for imperialism and corporate gain. Yet, several political ideologies are gaining traction in the U.S., but have virtually no representation within the political and media establishment. So if you've tuned into this show hoping to hear the dueling perspective of Democrats and Republicans, well, you've come to the wrong place. Because today, I'll be hosting a discussion with people who represent the voices of a growing alternative. We'll be talking about libertarianism, anarchism, and socialism, three philosophies gaining momentum as more and more people are becoming disillusioned with the status quo. So to talk about everything from the role of government to an ideal society, I'm joined now by a brilliant panel in breaking the set's first ever alternative voices debate, starting with Scott Crow, author of Black Flags and Windmills and founder of the Anarchist Common Ground Collective. Austin Peterson, production director at Freedom Works and editor of LibertarianRepublic.com, and Eugene Perrier, former vice presidential candidate of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Thanks so much, all of you, for coming on. Thanks so much for having us. Before we start this epic debate, or conversation, rather, I wanted you to briefly outline your political ideologies in about a minute's time, Scott. When people think of anarchism, they think total chaos. Can you break down that misconception for us? It's a misconception. Anarchy is a, a, a living and dynamic framework based in um, uh, uh, ideas of cooperation, where we can all get along to make each other, the world better for each other. We call it mutual aid. The ideas of direct action, that we don't have to wait on others, that we are more than voters, we are more con than consumers, it, that we, there are other paths that we should take, and we don't need to wait on others to do it. We start to do it ourselves, and we do it in our communities. The ideas of... Uh, of uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a myriad of collective liberation that we're all tied in this together that that I don't want to do better on the back of somebody else and I don't want somebody to do better on the back of me that again we're in this together and these ideas have a long uh, over a hundred year tradition of libertarianism but it's social libertarianism where it's 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 that's the better for all of us and and it's also anti-capitalist and I think that that's a really important distinction to make because capitalism has been exploitative capitalism has been oppressive to communities all over the planet and to, the, to an extraction of resources in destroyed the earth along the way. Thank you. Uh, and Austin, libertarianism is gaining traction, yet has been so convoluted by the establishment. Right. Describe true libertarianism to our audience. True uh, libertarianism would be uh, called classical liberalism, meaning you get all of your liberties. You get your social liberties and you get your economic liberties. And I would disagree that capitalism exploitative. I think that capitalism is what allows us to accrue the materials that we need to help more people. So if I go out and I make a lot of money like Bill Gates, then I have money to do things like invest in cancer research or in malaria research and to do uh, more good things for the community. So to me, it's really about the idea that you should be allowed to have as much liberty as possible without harming someone else. But, you know, really, H.L. Macon had this funny quote. He says, you know, I believe in one thing, liberty, but I don't believe in it enough to force it on anyone else. So if you don't believe that you have the right to force your beliefs on anyone else, you might be a libertarian. <laughs> and Eugene, you represent the big, scary beast that so many people run the opposite direction. One of the, probably the most misunderstood philosophies currently in this country explain socialism for the audience. Of course. Well, in a nutshell, socialism is essentially the mirror opposite of capitalism. It's using the massive wealth and, and, and great things that we know our society can be created by and, you know, not waiting on a Bill Gates, for example, to solve cancer, but mobilizing the governmental power, the democratic power of people concentrated in a governmental state power to defeat cancer if we know we need to defeat cancer, to build affordable housing if we know we need to build affordable housing, and all these things that as a society we know we have consensus on in terms of, you know, a humane standard of living. 
so socialism ultimately is a means of actualizing a humane standard of living, but recognizing that both counter-revolutionary pressures, the long history of class society, does require sort of an organizational structure that can mitigate sort of the different uh, and varying realities of humanity to move towards that future that ultimately would be a classless society, which is communism. And let's take a look at some domestic issues uh, going on right now. Um, right now, 46.2 million people are living below the poverty line in this country. On top of that, of 25 cities surveyed, 21 have seen an increase in homelessness. And finally, despite Obama's job numbers report, only about 60 percent of American adults are working, which means 40 percent aren't. Austin, what would you do right now to help the homeless, the food insecure, and the unemployed? It's a great question. So the first thing is, is you have to look at how these statistics are measured. So if 46 percent of people in the United States are below the poverty line, what is the poverty line in the United States? And take a look at us in, in global terms. The people who are on the poverty line in the United States have cell phones, they have two cars, they have microwaves, they have refrigerators. So the free market system that America provides allows even the poor people in the United States, which I don't think there's anyone who believes that you could ever eradicate all poverty, but that you want to raise the standards of living across the board. Capitalism means that as the rich get richer, the, the poor get richer too, and more people have more opportunities for more jobs. So I think that if we were going to do things to help the poor, we would do things like we would create, uh, you know, we would deregulate a lot of our system, and we would put into place more institutional regulations, such as free market regulations or tort reform, to do things like give incentives to people to actually help. Right now what happens is, is we, when we create big government policies to help out poor people, you have lots of unintended consequences and what happens is is that people who are in their communities are not incentivized to help one another so we create this big government and everyone assumes that the big government is going to help the poor people but when you deregulate and you stop taxing people to go and do charity you incentivize people to go and give charity what incentive do we have to go out and give charity right now when we have 40 percent of what we own taxed and given away so there's no incentive right now but what I want is for communities to be brought together by the fact that they need each other I think people need to need each other and when we create a big government, we say, oh, well, the big nanny state will take care of things, and I want to create a state of people who are more self-reliant. And Scott, I'm sure you'd take a, a different approach? Sure. I, I, I agree with the self-reliance, but I, I don't, not individual self-reliance. I think we need to take government out of the picture, but I also say we need to take multinational corporations out of the picture also, because there is no real free market in this, in this country. You have, you have basically, uh, you know, private, profit, uh, private profits, but subsidized risk. And we don't talk about that when we talk about free markets. But what I want to do is take the long term. It took hundreds of years for us to build up to the power dynamics that we have today. And what I want to do is unwind all of those, that we don't rely on governments and we don't rely on corporations to do all these things and that we start to build and exercise power from below and that is localized economies built on, on solidarity and mutual aid where people instead of relying on governments for handouts that they start to work on food security themselves create community gardens create victory gardens create community supported agriculture these small scale things um, creating our own health care if there's a nationalized health care fine but we need localized health care because there's people who still fall through that net for real all of these things we start to rebuild the infrastructure in civil society outside of multinational corporations and governments. And Eugene? Yeah, well, I mean, I think if we want to help the poor in America, we have to break the power of the capitalist class. I mean, you know, corporations in the United States have over a trillion dollars that they refuse to invest. Uh, you know, a small, tiny elite of people, this is the essence of capitalism. And this is what we've seen over the past 30 years or so, that inequality has actually increased. So the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten uh, poorer. And it is relative, because wealth is relative. You can't measure wealth based on, you know, some abstract principle from somewhere else, but on the abundance of your own society. And I think what we see here is the vast majority of wealth accrues to a small amount of people and I think ultimately we have to ultimately eliminate the capitalist class and allow the broad masses of people to yes rely on themselves and through democratic self-practice work together to decide what the priorities are and use the massive productive and uh, abilities of our country to meet those and let's move on to Wall Street right now of course we have too big to fail banks CEOs of Wall Street immune to prosecution apparently and take a look at this article corporate profits have risen almost 20 times faster than workers income since 2008 yet they're not hiring and virtually paying zero in taxes Austin how would you regulate Wall Street Oh, good question I would let the market regulate Wall Street see what has happened is after the New Deal corporations got in bed with the government and they said well we need to work together so that we can stimulate our economy and they said well let's 
build infrastructure projects, for example. And what big government is doing is it's taking all of our wealth and it's redirecting them to what they think is a good use. So I think what we have to do is we have to set uh, corporations into the marketplace and force them to compete. Right now, for example, Obamacare is a perfect example. It guarantees profits to corporations. So it's basically a bailout. Obamacare basically says that these, inst these institutions, these insurance companies, they are never going to go bankrupt because they are going to get a guaranteed salary from the state. Look at our farmers. Our farmers are heavily subsidized. And what happens? You get what you're talking about, the stratification of wealth, and it goes to the top. But you have to understand is that corporations, when they're in a free market, they're in a much more chaotic uh, atmosphere, and they can be eaten up by smaller competitors much easier when they aren't hyper-regulated. The corporations write the regulations, and then the Congress goes in and passes them so that they benefit the big corporations because they don't like competition. Big corporations don't like capitalism. It's the small businessmen that have to compete in an economy that, don't, that, that are harmed by regulations. So if you're going to talk about regulations, I would set them afloat out in the ocean and make them fight for their own profits because what would happen is that the smaller businesses would come in and they would eat their lunch. And Eugene, how do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I think the reality is we live in a society where it is correct that monopoly capitalism dominates the, the whole of the economy. But, you know, as it concerns the banks and the Wall Street, there's significant self-regulation uh, already. The uh, Basel capital buffer agreements and other things like that are uh, sort of industry-regulated things. So I think that already exists. And we see, you know, like the California energy example, uh, when, when deregulation happens en masse, there's a significant amount of gaming the system, uh, the competition. It creates more anarchy, if you will and creates sort of a, a situation where volatility is introduced in a major way. I think ultimately with Wall Street, what we have to do is eliminate the profit motive. I mean, it's ultimately the profit motive that drives all corporations and capitalism, and it drives Wall Street to pursue more and more and more reckless uh, ways of making profit because that's what competition does. Competition certainly forces you to put profit above all, which moves you into more riskier behavior, which moves you into economic crisis, bubbles, volatility, and, and so on. I just have one quick question. We have about a minute left. But Austin, um, how would the market prevent the monopolies from forming if there is no regulation? Well, you have to take a look at what is a monopoly. So for example, does anybody have a monopoly on all of the oil supplies all over the world? And what are the products that people absolutely require for their basic living standards? So if you're saying that Microsoft has a monopoly, you are basically saying that everyone has a right to Microsoft's products in the first place. So if you were talking about a monopoly, the number one monopoly we have right now is the monopoly on force, which is what the government owns. So I really do want to break up monopoly. I would like to end the monopoly on our banking system owned by the Federal Reserve. I'd like to end the monopoly on our agriculture system by the Department of Ag. So the real monopolies are the government monopolies because those are the monopolies on force and there are no other choices. But the free market is not a monopoly because you have choices and can take your money and move it somewhere else. Not so with the IRS. And Scott, do you have anything to add? Um, what would an anarchist society do with the banking system that we see right now? I don't want a kinder, gentler capitalism. I don't want a kinder, gentler government. I don't want either of them. We don't need either them. And multinational corporations are an aberration of what of small business, and they should not even exist. There is always if there's concentrated wealth. No one can make a decision about that. There is no there's no free economies. There's no free market. That's all that's all pipe dream stuff. And so again, what I'm talking about is localized economies, bringing it back where people can be face to face make decisions, where people in bioregions can make decisions about the resources. You know, there are there are monopolies. Exxon Mobil has a, a monopoly. They own upstream and downstream all the oil that touches anybody in this planet, and. Um, and whether in a free market or with governments, it's like, I don't want a kinder jailer ExxonMobil. I don't want ExxonMobil. And we're going to talk about civil liberties next. Always amazing to hear you guys' perspective. Stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. I got news for you, gang. The world is round. Breaking news. Casualties in Iraq. That's my kid. Don't tell me how much time I spent helping. And the Prime Minister. Hey, you say no foreign aid whatsoever. Watch what happens. And coming up next. Never seen anything like this on television. 
Welcome back to Breaking the Set's first alternative voices debate. Let's talk civil liberties. As we know, since 9-11, Republicans and Democrats have pretty much been unified in their support for the evisceration of the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, from everything from the Patriot Act to the NDA, militarization of local police forces and everything in between. Um, Scott, under anarchism, would there be a constitution at all? How would people's rights be protected? And what would the role of the police look like, if any? Well, uh, in the sh there's short term and long term, right? So the short term is there'd be transitional parts where, where people set up their own constitutions and their localized economies as we, as we dismantle this larger system. And in the long term, that maybe some people want to organize around that like they did in Spain in 1930s, or, or maybe they don't. Maybe we're like indigenous cultures just have it by, by, by word of mouth and family and culture. I mean, that's for communities to decide themselves. But the thing is, we don't need those pieces. We don't need the force of the state, the threat of use of force to back capital in any way. And that, I think, dismantling is, is important. And when you talk about Patriot Act, I mean, as somebody who's been a victim of the Patriot Act, I was listed as a domestic terrorist and under investigation for 10 years, although I was never charged with anything. I am definitely against omnibus bills like that, where just everybody comes to the trough and gets to sell everything. The war on terror is a sham. And what it's done is it's, it's criminalized dissent in this country. And that's had a chilling effect on things. The second thing is that it's created this false, this false um, war on the Muslim communities and people of Middle Eastern descent, as well as political dissent in this country. And what about the police? Who would police society? Well, I can tell you what we did after New Orleans was we policed ourselves. We took up arms in armed self-defense because I'm an advocate of armed self-defense and that we said that we will do ourselves because we cannot rely on the police because they were trying to kill us and that, that we would try to, to, to do it in the best way that we could by with the communities that we are there. And we had to deal with sexual assault. We had to deal with white militias trying to kill black people in communities. Very seriously, taking a long history from social justice activists who had come before us and, and movements who had come before us who had also done the same thing. And I say that we have to have community control. We must break this down, that we must know who our neighbors are, who, and, and, and I don't like the word policing, but take care of ourselves, self-determination for each of the communities. Eugene, what about you? How would you propose to revamp the Constitution if, if you would go that route? And how would you deal with government repression if all the power is concentrated by the state? Yeah, you know, certainly. Well, I wouldn't want to, you know, say too much about a Constitution because I wouldn't want to preempt the opportunity of people to, to speak on that. But I think there would be a new Constitution, a revolutionary Constitution constitution that would enshrine the thing, whatever it may be, education, employment, that people thought were the sort of important foundational bedrock rights to be supported. But I don't think all the power would be concentrated in the state. I actually think ultimately, and this is something that socialists and Marxists always say, that we want the state to wither away. We want a state to exist with its whole aim being to eliminate the need for a state. But ultimately, there's counter-revolutionary impulses. I mean, if you know we say we want free education, and then there's a party of people who are willing to use armed struggle and sabotage to make it all possible, again, for only a small elite to go to college, we would want to suppress that. But ultimately, it's the democratic power of the people and the institutions determined by the people that hold the power, which is something that sort of everyone always says. But certainly under socialism, we want to try to actualize that by making, making power sort of really from the bottom up, whether it's the factories, the neighborhoods, the schools, and a committee-like uh, committee basis that can build more or less in a pyramid-type way up to the top and, uh, and power, have power checked in that basis. And also, with virtually no government oversight, how would you regulate these massive corporations that are entrenched in the surveillance state and, and are, in fact, profiting off the spine? We have about a minute left. Well, remember, after 9-11, the war on terror kicked in, and the military-industrial complex stepped in and said, you know, we're going to go ahead and fill full of these contracts. So the corporations are doing acting out their natural desires. They're going out and getting these contracts that the government is handing them. So I think we were, what was happening was that we were just looking for the new 21st century conflict, and that just happened to come along. The act of terrorism gave them the right to do what they were already doing. You understand Dick Cheney was writing the Patriot Act 10 years before it happened, Joe Biden as well. Uh, we're penning those kinds of civil liberties violations 10 years before those events happen. So, I mean, there's always a steady growth of government, and people, libertarians always say that as government grows, liberty recedes. So I think what, hap what has to happen is that we need to have a culture of self-empowerment, individual empowerment, and a, a belief in the Second Amendment, which talks about individual liberty and the right to self-defense for ourselves. We don't really need a huge supranational government to keep us safe from anything other than perhaps a North Korean nuclear missile strike. For the most part, Americans can protect themselves if we are empowered to protect themselves. Do you think that if pilots were armed on, in every single cockpit that those that those people would have been able to pull off that kind of an attack? Absolutely not. But we were taught to be afraid. We were taught to stand down. If terrorists stood up, no, don't say anything. Just give in. Instead, we need to have an individual empowerment mentality in this country that we are responsible for our own security. And I think that applies to national security as well. When you talk about things like terrorism, the Constitution actually has a provision in it, in Article 1, Section 8, called Letters of Mark and Reprisal. And this was stated by Congressman Ron Paul 
call the day after the attacks. He says, why do we need to invade? Why do we need to give, spend all of these trillions of dollars and send tanks into the desert when all we need is to send SEAL Team 6 in or basically private mercenaries, which was the constitutional uh, uh, equivalency of that, and just take them out, get it over with, and come home. But right now, we have this whole idea that in order for us to have you know, freedom, we need to have regime change and occupation. And that's not the way to go. And let's, let's actually dovetail off what you're saying, and I want to give you guys a hypothetical scenario right now. If there were a terrorist attack in this country on the same scale, if not bigger than 9-11, um, being non-interventionist, typically, as a libertarian, how would you respond? Would you just send in kind of that force that you were just talking about? Absolutely. Well, the Constitution is very clear, and the letters of mark and reprisal haven't been used since sort of the days of high sales. So I think the thing that we have to do is we need to update that provision of the Constitution, and we need to give Congress the power to perform those assassinations. Because if a terrorist makes a credible threat and is possibly going to kill American citizens, and we have intelligence to that, we need to be able to take action for that. But what we don't need to do is take a ham-handed approach, invade these countries, create more terrorists and have them come back and kill us because we're not targeting our bombs and we're killing civilians. So what has to happen is we have to have targeted approaches. Now, constitutional mercenaries, they are under the law, meaning if they kill an innocent civilian, they're liable for that damage. Soldiers are not because of the way the laws of war are, uh, the laws of war are structured. So if we have uh, evidence of a terrorist attack, I think we need to revive these constitutional provisions because it allows us to do a surgical strike with uh, its very free market. It allows us to hire mercenaries, and then you get in, you get the job done, and you come back home with no nation building, and it's less than $2 trillion, I guarantee it. Eugene, what's your response? Well, I think the uh, sort of important context of your, your question is 9-11, and I think uh, the most important thing is to talk about the reciprocal sort of cycle of violence put forward by the acts of reprisal after 9-11. I mean, what we really need to look at if we want to prevent terrorist attacks in an overarching way is what makes people want to attack the United States. And we certainly know that the policies, the imperialistic policies of the United States around the world engender more hate hatred towards the United States government, if not the United States people, uh, than anything else that takes place. And I think what we need to really be talking about is that, and not sort of these sort of, well, if they come get us, how do we go get them, or, you know, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The real question is, how do we create sort of a, a system in this world that's based on humanity, based on, you know, sort of mutual aid, if you will, mutual support, uh, and not one based on sort of these reciprocal acts of violence, which is what I think these hypotheticals, when they're posed in the U.S. media and posed like, in shows like 24, you know, would you kill a baby if you knew there was going to be a terrorist attack next week or something. Like, you know, it never happens that way. Right. But, you know, people pose it these questions and so it sort of put us in a sense of fear and make us answer in a way that I think is always the most warlike. And let's talk about foreign policy in general. Right now we're hearing a lot of strong rhetoric coming from the political media establishment about Iran, Syria, and most recently North Korea. Uh, I wanted to play a quick uh, soundbite from that. The U.S. is tracking a mobile missile launcher that has been moved within North Korea by train. The launcher has the ability to strike Japan as well as U.S. bases in Okinawa and Guam. Adding to the fears, today, the young leader of the North said the moment of explosion is coming. So, Scott, under an anarchist state, um, or I guess not state, but under an anarchist system, how would these kind of threats be dealt with? I guess dovetailing off of what, have you, what Eugene just said, would you go kind of more that route of just community cooperation, not the eye for the eye type thing? Well, the long-term thing is that historically nation states are new, new to this planet and they haven't worked and that we, we would dismantle them. We would take down false borders. Um, I think that we'd also dismantle the military industrial complex. We'd just start taking it away because we don't need it. If we're not an imperialist force who is actually trying to draw resources, labor, um, in, 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 uh, you know, the natural world from other places, then we don't need it. And if we, if we put in systems of federations where people can actually federate by voluntary association Association and ex exchange resources how they want, that's fine. But what I want to do is break it down. We, we built these huge systems and we need to break them down. Now, that doesn't get rid of the, the nukes immediately, but we start to dismantle these systems bit by bit. Again, we've built this stuff for hundreds of years. We need to unwind it. But we have to ask the question first, why is it like that? And Eugene, after these threats are made, I mean, if the U.S. makes an overture for peace with North Korea, would that not make this country look weak? I don't think it would make this country look weak at all. I mean, the United States has thousands of nuclear weapons. They have the most powerful military. The United States government spends more money by far than anyone else on their military. It's, I mean, in the past two decades, they've invaded two countries. They use military power all across the world in really completely unfettered ways. So I don't think a peace treaty with Korea, which ultimately, and people need to remember this, the armistice that was put in place after 1953 was supposed to evolve into a peace treaty. The United States government has consistently denied uh, a, a peace treaty, but I don't 
know why anyone would think the United States was weak for not wanting to basically kill hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And, and Austin, if the military scaled back to the point that, let's say, Ron Paul uh, proposes it to be, what's the danger to America losing its posture as the force of this military strength in the world? Well, you know, that's a good question. And a lot of people kind of give Ron Paul a hard time because he just says, well, well let's just come, come home. And I think that there are ways to do scaled drawdowns that don't put the United States national security interests in any danger. But I think that the places that you have to look are places like Germany and Japan, where we've been for over 50 years, and we can start making cutbacks. Because really what we're doing, we're subsidizing the national defense of wealthy countries. So I think that if you were ta to take a target approach, excuse my expression there, target approach and to bring our troops home from places like that, we can begin to take a more uh, pacifistic um, viewpoint and people will see us as saying, hey, looks like they're not going to be as warlike anymore. But you have to make, you also have to explain to people in clear terms that we will not allow aggression on our sand or on our soil. The thing with North Korea is, if you look at that situation, it's obvious that the military junta is just charging him up. He's untested. He's untried. They just just want to see, you know, if he can prove that he's as gutsy as his father and his grandfather. So I don't necessarily fear anything from North Korea, but I do believe that we need some sort of missile defense system so that these people know that there's no way that they could ever hit our mainland. Because the American people, if you think that they are warlike now, you let another 9-11 happen on our soil, and I guarantee you these people are going to go nuts because the government will bring the fear factor back. So we have to take measured steps, I think, to do a tactical drawdown in certain areas to show that we are no longer a hostile imperialist power. Eugene, I wanted to follow up with the, the whole pacifism idea, but using the military as a peacekeeping force. I mean, do you recommend or what do you think about? I mean, with a country so wealthy, do we not have a responsibility to help countries like Burma, the genocide that's going on right now? And how would you use the military for that? Or would you? Well, I mean, I think if we look at the record of most of these so-called peacekeeping missions, they're some of the most warlike things. I mean, if you look at the eastern part of Congo, for example, where over four million people have died in the long conflict there, uh, a report came out from, I believe it was the UN inspector general, but a report was made of the UN force there. And they were engaged in the same type of profiteering uh, and, and just, just despicable behavior as all the other militaries in, in, in the region. And the same thing with peacekeeping missions. I mean, the Korean War was a police action to go keep peace. But in Yugoslavia. your ideal society. Sure, sure. Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that the United States has any sort of onus to use its military to enforce on other people what we think is right. I mean, just because I'm a revolutionary socialist doesn't mean that if people in Mexico aren't revolutionary socialists, I should, you know, gin up some controversy and use peacekeepers to put them in place, which is essentially exactly how peacekeepers are used now. And I don't think we should repeat that policy. And you guys, that's it for the debate today. Thank you so much, everyone. I think that the most important thing is how many commonalities we all have with each other in terms of restoration of civil liberties, ending the imperialism, the militarism. And thank you so much for all of your input and time. Thank Eugene you so much Carrera, for having us. Austin you, Peterson thank and you. Scott Crow. I really you. appreciate it. Well, that wraps things up with Breaking the Set's first ever Alternative Voices debate. And if you like what you see, let me know on Twitter at Abby Martin or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Breaking the Set. Let's just make sure that this is just the beginning. Even though the mainstream marginalizes the alternative, we know that these beliefs aren't fringe. So it's time to focus on what unites us, not what divides us. So instead of fighting with each other, let's work to understand each other.